This video is brought to you by HelloFresh. So 2020 has been an interesting year, and by interesting, I mean garbage. But one of the genuinely interesting things was Machine Gun Kelly switching to pop punk and releasing one of the best songs of the year, Bloody Valentine. And the added highlight to that experience was the music video featuring the queen, Megan Fox. And just like that, she's back on the radar. Anyways, all this Megan Fox promotion kind of put Jennifer's body back in my brain. I know that last year was the 10 year anniversary, but I was like, you know what? I kind of want to give this a go for, you know, an October related Halloween video. And guess what month it is, people? It's, it's October. And I purposely underslept last night so I could really channel that demon Jennifer aesthetic. It's totally intentional that I look this bad today. So Jennifer's Body is the 2009 comedy horror film written by Diablo Cody as her follow-up to indie academy darling Juno. And to say these are different movies, is an understatement. The core quirk is very similar, but these are fundamentally different movies all around. So obviously after winning an Oscar for Juno, Diablo Cody was kind of given free reign to make whatever project she wanted. And what she wanted was Jennifer's body. My entire life had dreamed of writing a horror movie. I had written Juno, which is not a horror movie, unless you think Unwanted Pregnancy is a horror, which I guess it kind of is. Yep, that's me. I'm that demographic. I would definitely rather be eaten by Megan Fox than be pregnant. Wait. Now this movie has finally found its audience, but at the time of release, it had kind of gone through a lot. And most of that is largely linked to how they chose to market the film. I spent an entire day watching interviews, but I know there's a video that keeps getting recommended around YouTube about the horror of bad marketing. So feel free to check that out for what I'm assuming is a bigger deep dive on this topic. But due to the success of Transformers and the sex symbol that was surrounding Megan Fox, the studio marketing team made the extreme extremely misguided choice of focusing on that aspect directed at young male audiences when this film was definitely more geared at young women. And you might be thinking, Amanda, the whole movie is just about Megan Fox being hot and killing boys. Exactly. But it's also so much more. Jennifer's body deals with a ton of different themes from the dynamics of toxic female friendships, the pressure girls face, confusion of sexuality, assault, themes of consent and male abuse of power, empowerment, and revenge. This is all very visible in the movie, but has been confirmed across the board by Diablo Cody, by the director, Corinne Kusama, even by the actors. It also has a banging soundtrack and features a slew of incredible performances from the cast. For all the outlandish and ridiculous pieces of dialogue in this movie, Megan's performance is absolutely incredible. Look at the scene with the band in the waterfall, a scene of her putting on makeup in the mirror, and yeah, even the ridiculous line drops. She did an amazing job that was largely overlooked for a long time just because she's who she was. When Diablo Cody said that Megan was always her Jennifer and that she had a mystique not often found in today's celebrities. And even Megan said that she couldn't imagine that role being played by anyone else. That's something that really comes through in the performance. I don't feel like anybody else could have done it but me. And that's such a weird- I agree. I kind of was that person in a way. It was like the allegory of what was going on in my life. And so it was the perfect, project for me at that moment. And while it has gone on to achieve that cult level success, finally finding its audience, I do genuinely think this movie was just a bit ahead of its time. Except for the clothing, the references, and the band posters. It's so 2000s that it hurts and warms my soul. Someone's getting murdered, but I see a Motion City soundtrack poster, so I'm in heaven. But that style of over the top, quirky comedy horror is way more prevalent and popular today than it was back then. And I also think that the themes are finally hitting with the target audience and they're just as relevant now, if not more so than they were back then. And the best part about this finding its audience down the road is that everybody involved in the movie can now just drag the studio for their horrible decisions. From a, a marketing person at the studio once, I had sent him this articulate defense of the film and here is how it should be marketed. And I, I said, what specifically are you thinking? And he wrote back, Megan Fox hot. Three words. Not only was the trailer pretty bad, but they also did extensive test screenings with focus groups rather than a wider audience. They were all essentially comprised of young men. One even giving the very helpful comment of needs more boobs, spelt exactly like I have it on screen. These are the opinions that the studio was taking seriously. And both Diablo Cody and Corinne Kusama made pleas to the studio about how badly it was being marketed and both were dismissed with similar rebuttals of Megan Fox hot. That was the only value the studio studio saw. I think it's also really telling that Megan says that this was her favorite role and Amanda Seyfried has said it was one of hers as well. Most of my fans, it's 
their favorite project that I've ever done. It's my favorite project that I've ever done. Jennifer's Body is my favorite movie that I've ever done. For something that was so critically panned when it came out, it, it's cool that it had such an impact on the people that were involved in it. But just watching this Hot Topic presented Q&A, the sheer excitement of the young ladies here should have let the studios know exactly how badly they messed up and who they should have been marketing it towards. Next up we have, last but not least, Megan Fox. Twilight had already happened at this point. Do they not realize the true power of the teen girl? We'll be weaving in some more insights as we go through the movie. I'm sure that's why a lot of you guys are here. So for now, I give you Jennifer's Body. The story of Anita Needy Lesnicki and the wild tumultuous relationship with her longtime best friend, Jennifer Check. We do get moments where we're exclusively following Jennifer, but Needy is our narrator and our eyes to this story. Which makes it all the more funny that the first trailer apparently didn't include Amanda Seyfried at all. I wish I could say I was making that up, but I'm not. It's the classic tale of a young girl getting sacrificed for a demonic ritual so a shitty indie band can get famous. Except when you sacrifice a non-virgin, bad things happen. So thematically, this actually has a lot in common with things like Mean Girls and Heathers, but it also works really well as a Ginger Snaps double feature. So many people have made that comparison in the past, but I love Ginger Snaps and I would love that theatrical double feature to happen here. But the dynamic of the dominant queen bee and the more timid friend in a high school setting and the final girl trope is almost identical. But with Jennifer's body, we also see a subverted first girl trope. So to the shock of many, this movie actually starts with Needy in a mental institution. Which honestly, if you had seen a trailer that didn't include Amanda Seyfried, would you not have been so confused? But her behavior here is directly at odds with the timid, mousy nature this character is going to have for most of the movie, as we find out exactly what got her here. Cause she's super violent in this intro, she's kicking orderlies, this honestly could have been an audition to be Harley Quinn. So how did this slightly awkward, mousy, timid teenager end up violently attacking people in an institution? So the setting for a horror movie is Devil's Kettle, which in the movie is the name of the whole town based around this waterfall with a mysterious pothole where nothing tossed in resurfaces. And while the town isn't real, the waterfall is, though I guess scientists figured out the secret in 2016, but we're just gonna ignore that. And it's here that we finally see Jennifer and look at the representation of this absolute 2000s bedroom. This looks like a Fall Out Boy music video set and it's glorious. Jennifer didn't always look this rough. Why does Megan Fox looking rough look better than I ever will? Not even jealous, just commenting. So we start going through the steps of what happened to Jennifer. And some people try to say that the stuff that happens with them later on came out of nowhere, but look at the look on her face. Look at how he, she is staring at her. Sandbox love never dies. And before anybody gets judgmental, Diablo Cody specifically said that there was a part of Needy that she didn't fully openly accept that was in love with Jennifer. And it's noted that they have likely had moments like this before. Anyway, Jennifer convinces Needy to go to a bar show because she's totally crushing on Seth from the OC. And Needy agrees. Wear something cute, okay? And the movie then goes through the standards of what wear something cute means to this friendship. Basically, don't look embarrassing, but also never upstage me. And that's just kind of the thing that can happen in a lot of friendships where one person feels like they have to be above someone else to feel okay. Jennifer is really insecure, so she can't be upstaged, and that is a huge part of their friendship. So from here, we get even more indications that the relationship between Jennifer and Needy might not be super even and healthy. Hell, her name is Anita, and she has the nickname Needies. And even if she's not super clingy, there is just a dynamic there that makes it impossible for her to say no to Jennifer, which is something that Chip notices. You always do what Jennifer tells you to do. No, I don't. It's just that I like the same things that she likes. And Jennifer notices. Come on, Needy. I promised Chip that I would hang out with him tonight. Bill. What time is the show? We'll pick you up at 8.30. And Jennifer honestly probably does this kind of stuff more than she needs to just to prove to Chip that she'll always be number one. And oh my God, I totally forgot that Chris Pratt was in this. That is hands down the best part about re-watching a movie you haven't seen in a while because certain actors' careers have just gone on these crazy trajectories. And there is Adam Brody, our evil indie rock band lead. You play your instruments really. Super good. And this is where things start to go downhill. Because for some reason, he seems super interested in whether or not she's a virgin. There's always that girl. They look to show it off, but they do not give it up. But Needy overhears this and is like, yeah, she's totally a virgin, so don't you even 
think about touching her. Meanwhile, I'm not even a backdoor virgin. There are at least 20 iconic turns of phrases in this movie that are just totally underappreciated. But yeah, that pretty much condemns Jennifer. So they start playing music and then some like weird seductive frickery starts happening to Jennifer. And then the venue catches on fire. People are getting trampled and burned. They somehow managed to make it out. And then Adam Brody just pops up there being like, hey, you guys are okay. Want to come back to our creepy van? I watched her get into that van and I knew something awful was going to happen. He was skinny and twisted and evil. Man, that was going to be a bad time for her, even if it wasn't for a satanic ritual. Which again is the point. That's the parallel. So Need is rightfully concerned and instantly calls Chip instead of, I don't know, the authorities. Did you get the make and model? I don't know, Chip, an 89 rapist. And then the doorbell rings and surprise, no one's there. But Jennifer is already in the house. And then she exorcists all over the floor. And before Needy can get an answer out of her, Jennifer pushes her against the wall in a way that should be terrifying, but... Are you scared? Why am I into this? Anyways, Jennifer runs off into the night. Needy is traumatized, but Jennifer is back at school the very next day, totally fine and genuinely unconcerned with everything that happened the night before. And because Needy is the only one who's really seen any of this stuff, the concern is just kind of falling on her. But the Jennifer facade can only stick around for so long. She seduces this other football player whose best friend died in the fire, but oh boy, is she hungry for something other than sex. All these animals start flooding forward, staring them down. Deer's like, ah, oh, no naked man chest, look away. And then she takes part in those urges that teenagers so often have, the flesh of their peers. Let it all out, kids. Suddenly there's all these news reports about how the band actually helped save people from the fire, which we all know didn't happen and it's pissing off Needy who's still iffy with Jennifer's behavior. And there's also a nice little Mean Girls throwback here, whether it was intentional or not. Other uh, line, hold on. So blow it off. It'll just be a minute. Ew. I'm crossing you out. Boo, you whore. And then we get the iconic tongue burning scene, which essentially shows that Jennifer has healing powers. That gif is still used to this day. But Chip ends up telling Needy that they found Jonas's body ripped limb from limb and that parts of him had been eaten. So obviously she thinks everything is connected, but Chip's like, oh no, there's no way that anything could get any worse than this. And homie, if 2020 is any indication, it can always get worse. So everyone's pretty depressed, except for Jennifer, who is thriving. The town was falling apart, but starting to heal the low shoulders song through the trees is the anthem of unity and things seemed like they might be turning around. We were f***ing idiots. Because the more the town seems to heal, the more Jennifer is falling apart. Manini's currently a little bit too distracted with low shoulder trying to take credit for rescuing people to fully notice. Rumor? It's true. It's on the Wikipedia. And oh no, this poor dear sweet emo kid is gonna get freaking murked. Jennifer originally turns him down, but Needy's like, oh no, he's really nice. Yo Needy, you just got Colin killed. Congratulations. I just got Aquamarine on DVD. It's about this girl who's like half sushi. Well. Time to bag it in. I can't imagine ever discussing a movie more eloquently than that. So Needy and Chip finally get some private time and Colin gets tricked into going to an abandoned house. So we're getting awkward teen sex on one side and awkward teen murder on the other. And this poor bastard knows he's about to be demoned. And in this moment, Needy is connected to Jennifer and can feel the things she's doing. So she freaks out, leaves, almost hits Jennifer stumbling out of the woods and gets home to find that Jennifer is already there waiting. But we always share your bed when we have slumber parties. Now I was old enough at this point, but hands up in the chat if this caused your gay awakening. Obviously this scene is one of the more controversial for a couple different reasons. As mentioned earlier, Diablo Cody said it was specifically included because a part of Needy loves Jennifer and Jennifer was taking advantage of that. And it's supposed to deal with the complexities of dealing with your sexual identity and all that jazz. I also feel like there's some misquotes from the actors concerning this scene. Megan and Amanda did both comment that it was uncomfortable. A lot of that just had more to do with the fact that filming scenes like that is uncomfortable and it was such an extreme close up and they both knew it was going to be misrepresented in a certain way by the studios. Yeah, we both dreaded filming that because we knew that's what was gonna happen. Nobody's gonna understand this. Nobody's gonna understand the intention. It's going to be turned into this sensational moment. Rather than being used to represent what it needed to in the movie, it was just used out of context to exploit the scene. Megan even joked in press tours that she wouldn't be surprised if the whole trailer was just the kiss and the contract from the studio specified 
specified that they had to be okay with the kiss being in the trailer. The movie hadn't even started filming and the studio already knew what they were gonna do with it. And increasingly over the years, it kind of started getting linked to queer baiting. But in 2009, you took your scraps and said, thank you. We can play boyfriend, girlfriend like we used to. That specific line is supposed to show to audiences that this isn't such an unusual first time thing and that their relationship is a little bit more significant than just a traditional friendship. So I don't think baiting was the intention. But hey, Jennifer is finally ready to explain what happened. So she's in the van and she, like Needy, thinks, hey, if I tell them I'm a virgin, they won't want to do anything with me. But they do not care that she's freaking out and honestly just enjoy the struggle. She even offers to be part of their street team to help promote the band. Like, do you guys remember street teams? Anyways, this scene is actually horrific in a lot of ways. The real horror of this scene isn't the fact that they're gonna murder her, it's the fact that they're laughing about it, that they're joking while they're doing it. And they legitimately don't care how horrified she is. Megan never breaks or has a fourth wall moment with the audience because in that moment, it's real. It's horrifying and they don't care as long as they get what they want from her. In a lot of interviews, Megan has actually touched on how this resonated with her Hollywood life, that they didn't care if she got hurt or tired or was dragged, disrespected, put in bad situations, as long as the studios got what they wanted from her. And then they stab her while singing the Jenny song, but it didn't kill her, at least not completely. I just know that I woke up and I found my way back to you. You know, this would have been sweet if she wasn't d craving flesh. And then Jennifer actually tries to gaslight Needy for having these delusions about what she thinks Jennifer might be doing after Jennifer said she was essentially put through a satanic ritual. So yeah, as mentioned, bad things happen when you sacrifice a non-virgin. But hey, they finally found Colin's body. He looked like lasagna with teeth. So Needy starts doing some Twilight level research on demons and tries to share her findings with Chip. Jennifer's evil. I know. No, I mean, she's actually evil, not high school evil. She found some information on demonic transference, which is what happens when you try to sacrifice somebody who isn't a virgin. The band still got what they wanted, but the demon goes on to live in the soul of the victim. The dance, it'll be like an all you can eat buffet. But Chip just thinks she's trying to break up with him and needs some serious psychological help, which, you know, I can't really blame him for. And despite her urging him not to go to the dance, he still goes. Ladies pepper spray. There's obviously a sicko out there who likes boys. A true sicko indeed. So it cuts to Jennifer losing her hair, looking into the mirror next to a picture of her before everything happened, just to show how much she's falling apart and trying to cover it up. But again, I don't even look that good right now. But Jennifer finds Chip as he's walking to the dance. She starts playing it up like she's worried about Needy's mental health. And obviously Chip is like, yeah, she's totally saying all these crazy things. So she tricks him into thinking that Needy doesn't like him anymore because she was having an affair with Colin, which is why she's been so weird since his death. Needy and Colin were intimate. And by that, I mean they were porking on a semi-regular basis. They start making out and again, Needy can feel it. She knows Chip is in trouble. So this whole part shows the level of competitiveness and jealousy that can happen in these friendships when they're not healthy. The insecurities people have and how they try to deal with them by not actually dealing with them. Jennifer making a move on Chip to prove she can and then gets super pissed when he ultimately decides he can't go through with it because Jennifer is second place to no one. Damn man, if you would just listen to your girlfriend about her demon theories, this wouldn't be happening. And from this point on, there is just an excellent stream of dialogue. Classics like, you're such a player hater. Nice insult, Hannah Montana. And my personal favorite, I thought you only murdered boys. I go both ways. So Needy gets there and Jennifer is already feeding on Chip. Yes, St. Jude, patron St. of all causes, please give me the power to crush this bitch. And while I really want to root for Needy, I must stand a flying Megan Fox. She's just covering. It's not that impressive. And it's at this point that Needy realizes how insecure Jennifer really is. She could have anyone she wanted, but she still had to go after Chip. And it's so much of their friendship is based on Jennifer holding Needy down so that she can feel better about herself. And then finally, after getting stabbed by Chip, the iconic, you got a tampon, and then she just leaves because she doesn't really want to hurt Needy and Chip dies. So Needy gears up for murder. Do you buy all your murder weapons at Home Depot? God, you're butch. So they start fighting, Jennifer bites Needy. Needy rips off the BFF necklace, which appears to shock Jennifer so much that allows Needy to get the upper hand. It just looks like it creates this like timeout on Jennifer's powers when it happens. But I think it was really just that moment where Jennifer realized that Needy was done with her. My dead, no, your heart. So she kills her and then Jennifer's mom walks in the room. So now we know why she's in a mental hospital. And we learned that if you get bitten by a demon and live, you absorb some of their powers. Just might get lucky for once in your miserable life. So she busts out and hunts down the band members that quite literally flips her life upside down. Must be one hell of a group. 
Tonight's gonna be their last show. Ending with a montage of the crime scene to Jennifer's body by hole. But hey, for all the insanity she's gone through, she's now a more confident, self-respecting individual. Gotta look for the positives. At least she's not eating people. Because if consuming the flesh of men isn't to your taste, have I got the deal for you with today's sponsor, HelloFresh, Canada's most popular meal kit. HelloFresh is the stress-free, minimal cleanup, pre-planned meal kit to make your life easier. I'm pretty much constantly working. I suck at cooking and a lot of times when I try to make new things, it's hard to use up all the ingredients before they go bad. HelloFresh has the most recipe variety of all the Canadian meal kits. So that means that every week you can pick from a bunch of new and exciting meals and they'll send you the exact portions you need to make each recipe along with simple step-by-step -step instructions that even idiots like me can follow. Less waste, less cleanup, great quality ingredients, and a ton of variety. It's been so easy this year just to fall into bad habits of ordering takeout constantly, but HelloFresh simplifies the meal making process while still delivering right to my door, saving me time and helps me eat healthier, which in the long run just makes me feel better. I wanted some more greens in my life this week, so I went with this Southwestern chicken salad and it is delightful. So click on that link in the description box down below and use code AMANDA80 to save $80 and get free shipping when you try out HelloFresh today. So that's gonna do it for today's video. I hope you guys all enjoyed. I know that this is definitely not the movie for everyone, but I am very happy that it has found its audience and is thriving in its own way years after its release. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. Thank you as always to my Patreon supporters. Anybody who's watching this video, subscribe to the channel. If you're new, like the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm definitely mostly okay, and I'll catch you all later.